mysterious island settled by mutineers. Maybe a portal back in time. To a world where predators reign and live by a different set of rules. The sharks are different. It's been days at sea, far from the shipping lanes, and thousands of kilometers from the nearest continent. A team of explorers travels deep into the South Pacific, toward a distant human outpost. Then, a tiny island appears in the mist. And here it is, the famous Pitcairn Island. What must be one of the most remote inhabited islands on the planet. It's called Adamstown. We're, uh, we're just about there. Few people have visited Pitcairn, let alone filmed here. To most outsiders, it's a complete mystery. We know very little about this island, but we know almost nothing about what's going underwater. That is what this team is here to change. Marine ecologist Enrique Sala has scoured the seas to find and help protect the ocean's last unspoiled places. I want to show to the world what the ocean was like hundreds of years ago and why we have to preserve them. Pitcairn's waters could be hiding a lost piece of the ocean's past. To find out, Enrique has built an all-star team of scientists. This will be a good home for the next month. Seven seasoned explorers and one young adventurer on his very first mission at sea. A uh, former nerd. I'm, oh. Uh, oh. You evolved. You look like a former nerd. <laughs> so Leading the ground expedition is National Geographic explorer Mike Fay. And we're we'll already checking it. out the bow for camping. You've been traveling across flat ground for the last nine months. Mike has trekked through the world's wildest places. As far as the eye can see, there are no humans. To see what life is like without us. Now, Enrique's team has joined forces with the Pew Environment Group. If they can crack the code of this unexplored world and even protect it, they may unlock secrets that can help marine life everywhere. It's a new role for Pitcairn, a place known for its history. Today's islanders are descendants of the most famous renegades in history. The mutineers of the HMS Bounty. Hi. Hello. Enrique. Paris. Paris, nice meeting you. Over two centuries ago, British sailors mutinied against their captain and fled to this uninhabited island with a few Tahitian men and women. They spent the rest of their lives in hiding. Today, their descendants are still here. Some carry the bloodline of Fletcher Christian, the mutiny's leader. You can imagine when the mutineers arrived on this uninhabited island, you know, they're, they're planning on living here forever. But um, luckily enough, and you think, wow, that's crazy, you know, that the Christians are still here. Ken, I recognize your photo. Hello. You are Enrique. Ah, I'm here to welcome. Hi, nice meeting you, Heather. Lovely to have you here. The community is tiny, with fewer than 60 people, and they survive in a world apart. Pitcairn is one of four islands tied to the community, but it's the only one with people. The nearest major landmass is New Zealand, 
some 5,000 kilometers away. These remote islands are graveyards to ships, home to unpredictable storms, and host to hidden threats. No one will know what they're facing until they dive below. The team heads to Ducey, the least explored of all the islands. So we made it to Ducey Atoll, the most remote of the Pitcairn Islands. There are no people here. Nobody ever comes here. Ducey is almost 500 kilometers east of Pitcairn. Over a kilometer across, it's barely a blip on the radar. It's an oasis in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> kind of amazing. This is one of the least studied reefs in the Pacific. This is going to be a, a first to measure the abundance and the biomass of the fish. The world below is a total mystery. Few humans have ever seen what this team is about to. Yep. So we jumped in the water and I couldn't believe it. We had never seen such a healthy and beautiful coral reef anywhere in the Pacific. You had the entire ecosystem, the entire food web, right there in front of your eyes. We saw blackjacks, surgeon fish, large groupers of different species, snappers, more eels. Then the sharks came. And they come in numbers. running wild over the reef. As the sharks close in, no one knows how they'll react. But Enrique's sure he's found something unusual. Sharks are the single most important indicator for the health of a coral reef. Having sharks on the reef is like having lions on the plains in Africa. The more sharks, the more it's like the primeval past. And this place is swarming with them. Topside, Mike Fay and his crew wonder what waits on land. Straight ahead of here, you can see there's a rip coming out, and we're just going to go in. Ducey is the outer island where hardly any Pitcairners go. Most people haven't really been there. And so I want to walk the entire atoll just to get kind of a notion of, you know, what are we dealing with here? You'll have some high tech help. Alan Turchik, the young rookie, has brought some new gear a mini drone to photograph Ducey from the air. So we're trying to get some high altitude uh, pictures using the helicopter for Mike so you can kind of see what the island looks like. It's going to be important to get some shots above so Mike can kind of see how he can make his way through the island. The helicopter can also spot things Mike might otherwise miss. Ducey's an atoll. Its circular band of coral rings an inner lagoon. But this aerial scout could reveal more about the island. Ah, better landing. <laughs> I'm excited about this little remote helicopter because I'm thinking, wow, this thing is unbelievable. I mean, it's like this little, little space machine, you know? God, we can fly this thing over these islands and you can basically do recce's with it. 
Uh, is there anything special that you want, Mike? Any pictures? That point over there, that seems to be like one of the main breeding areas for the petrels. Okay. And so this thing just goes I was like, you know, what's the range on the radio of that thing? Because you know, I'm thinking things get pretty far away and it looks like it's getting carried by the wind, you know. And he's like, no, it's pretty good, you know, and he's still kind of in virtual mode looking at the screen and, and I'm looking at the helicopter and I'm thinking that thing is like whipping away from this. <laughs> Alan quickly discovers his drone has gone rogue. And then all of a sudden you see like panic modes start to set in. He's like, nur, 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 nur. and he's like, I don't know what direction it is. I can't, I can't see which direction it's going. And he starts running after this thing. And that thing is whoop. And that was the last we saw of the helicopter. It was gone. So much for the helicopter. <laughs> Too much wind. Helicopters lost at sea. MIA. <laughs> you may be a, a decent pilot, but you're not that great. <laughs> With the helicopter lost, Mike will have to explore Ducey the hard way, one step at a time. Just offshore, the dive team faces challenges of its own. Sharks dominate this perfect reef, and the numbers are overwhelming. As they close in, Enrique knows that anything can happen. This close contact could come at a price. Ducey's sharks are not shy, and they're lightning fast. In a second, they could bite the divers before anyone even noticed. The team doesn't scare easily. Likely, the sharks are just curious. Chances are, these sharks have never seen a human before. You don't belong there. We're, we're aliens in this environment. Um, it's like being in outer space except with life. The more sharks there are, the better it is for the reef. We used to believe that on a coral reef, the biomass of small fish outweighs that of large predators like sharks. But Enrique finds that the opposite is true on an untouched reef. Imagine that you go to Africa and you find more than one lion per every wildebeest and zebra and giraffe. You would say it's impossible. Pristine coral reefs are like this. Predators dominate. Oh, this place is wild. There were two white tip sharks and four gray reef sharks and thousands of men away eating everywhere and swimming in the water column. It was like an aquarium. <laughs> really, really wonderful place. Really pristine. As far as we could see, there were these pale blue corals, like giant roses, covering all of the bottom. Every time our team get out of the water, they had this huge smile, they were laughing, they were talking about all the fish that we saw. It was really extraordinary. Like the sharks themselves, the evidence is overwhelming. Ducey's reef is an underwater Eden. Back on land, the island is a whole other world. hot and muggy and sunny. You think, oh, we're on this beautiful atoll and it's paradise. Well, when you're walking those transects, it's not paradise at all. It's hell. We're here on Ducey Island, surveying petrels and I think of seabirds. You don't quite think of where they nest, but on this particular island, they nest in this turn of 40 of forest just pretty dense stuff. Here's one. Little Murphy. Hey guy, what you doing? Like many seabirds, petrels thrive on Ducey. 
But Mike discovers something disturbing. Dead birds lie scattered on the beach. Looks like they got eaten by something. That's not a good sign. Third dead bird. Fourth dead bird. Immediately, we start seeing dead petrels. See, something looks like it's been chewing on the bones here. But what is killing them? Dead birds all over this place. The carnage is worse at the lagoon. Yes, yeah, so we have like 130 dead birds here. And what's amazing is they're all just about fledged out. They all died about the same time, almost like a disease came along or something. You know, and you think, that's freaking crazy. It's like bird after bird after bird after bird after bird after bird. These guys are just about, they were fledged. It's like, what kills birds like that? Mike heads into the forest to search for answers. It doesn't take him long to find clues. Look at this little guy, he's just stuck in the middle of this weedy patch. And they're nesting in this just ground herb in the boiling sun. And these chicks are just like covered with the fruits, like honey coated fruits, and they're covered in them. They're obviously never gonna be able to fly. The island has been invaded by an alien plant, a weed that may have been brought by birds or by man. Now it's grown out of control, trapping birds in its sticky goo. You think, God, one little thing like that completely changes the island. Mike can't be sure it killed all the birds, but one thing is clear, Ducey's landscape has been altered and its future is uncertain. After exploring the reef, Enrique knows there's no time to waste. Ducey's waters are untainted, but for how long? Ducey had the clearest water and the healthiest coral reef we have ever seen. It's 100 meters, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and we all left Ducey with one thought, this place has to be protected. There is no other option. How many places like Ducey are left? You know, when you see corals just layered on top of each other like that. It's a beautiful sight, huh? Isn't it nice? Wow, wow. yeah. But ahead lies another island where life is strangely different. And we are arriving to Henderson Island, which is a raised atoll. Uh, and now it's covered by impenetrable forest. Henderson is about 200 kilometers from Pitcairn. And at seven kilometers across, the largest of the four islands. Like Ducey, it's now uninhabited. But people have spent time here before. Replay. Enrique okay, wants to see to if they've left a mark. We're going to do our first dive now at uh, Henderson Island. and. The reef looks really gorgeous. We can see from the boats and the water is so clear. Damselfish, butterfly fish, more eels. These large red snappers, which were very inquisitive, Probably the most exciting thing at Henderson was the sharks. Like at Ducey, sharks swarm Henderson's reef. But here, they're bigger. And bolder. And no one knows what they'll do next. The sharks move in toward Enrique and the team. The sharks were very curious and they came to check us out very closely. Almost too curious. They're clearly bolder than the sharks at Ducey. Enrique soon realizes why. 
we were diving with this diving gear that doesn't produce any bubbles. So we were very silent. Soon the team is surrounded by sharks. They come wow, really close to, the, to us to check us out. It was a really exciting dive. The heart-pumping encounter drives Enrique to explore further. We cheated death once again. <laughs> to see if sharks <laughs> patrol even further below. On the ship, Alan Turchik prepares a deep water camera. This is a drop cam. It can go down to uh, the deepest part of the ocean. It has been actually down to the Marianas Trench. Hopefully we'll see some fish come up and uh, check it out. For the young explorer, it's a chance to redeem himself after losing the chopper on Ducey. This is probably the first time uh, anything's been filmed this deep before, in this area, for sure. By day's end, they'll see what life is like 600 meters below, and may even discover creatures no one has seen before. Mike Fay is anxious to hit the beach. For a terrestrial explorer, Henderson is a treasure island. Henderson, from a land-based perspective, is certainly one of the most amazing places in the entire Pacific Ocean. So you've got this huge coral plateau that's 100 feet above sea level that's covered with this vegetation. There are still many species of plants to be discovered on this island. For me, this place is is gonna be awesome, I know it is, you know. Okay, I'm here on uh, Henderson Island, up on the plateau. It's only about 100 feet above sea level, but it's a hard coral bed up here. This coral is like razor sharp. This place is like walking through a mountain of broken glass. Then you, you are dealing with this very dense vegetation. It's practically primeval, a living example of an ancient world. UNESCO designated Henderson a World Heritage Site because of its rare native birds, like crakes and fruit doves. But now they're at risk, threatened by an invasive predator. The Polynesian rat was brought by Polynesians to almost every island in the Pacific. And one of the things they eat is young birds, and they're extremely voracious. And we've had a de-ratification on Henderson just months previous to our arrival. A team of exterminators spread rat poison across the island. Mike's big question is if it worked. Their objective was to get rid of 100% of the rats on this island and not kill all the endemic crakes. Our objective here is to see if the crakes are still around and see if we see no rats. And then all of a sudden you see this little black thing like flash. And I got a crake. We got the crake. The crake is right in front of me here. I'm gonna pan over to the crake. That's what we were looking for. A little creaky. So it looks like a chicken. It's kind of acting like a chicken, but it's this little flightless bird in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you're looking at it. Hey, little creaky. So how did he get there? And he's flightless, and he's in the middle of the ocean, you know? Crazy little bird. Those crakes are about the coolest little animals I've ever seen, like little gnomes in the forest, mixed between a gnome and a chicken. Mike Fay's seen something move in the thick brush. I see a rat. I absolutely see a rat. I see a rat. You think rat. And, and all, but all you've seen is this fleeting movement in this dense bush. I'm gonna take a picture of it. So I walk up really fast. And I lower my eyes and then this rat is just sitting there on this branch. And it's like, it's a rat. It's a rat, it's a rat, it's in my brain, it's a rat, it's a rat, it's a rat, it's a rat. And then I try to take some pictures. 
But of course, it's like the Yeti thing, you know, UFOs, they're all blurry. In the video, you can kind of see the rat, but you, it's, it's not clear, you know, it's blurry, but you can see the form of the rat clearly. And this is a huge deal. You know, if there is a rat on this island, the probability of me seeing the only rat on this gigantic island is basically zero when you round it out. Rats are definitely a bummer. No doubt about it, after all that time and effort to get rid of the rats. That means that entire dynamic between the creeks or the rails and everything else on that island that is impacted by rats, you've kind of reset the clock. It's troubling news. Though humans left Henderson long ago, their footprint remains. So far, only the reefs seem untouched. So uh, we just picked up the signal from the drop cam that we put down yesterday. And so we're gonna go pick it up. Alan Turchik retrieves the drop cam from 600 meters below. Oh yeah, I see it. This should be interesting footage because it's the deepest we've dropped it so far since we've been out at the Pickering Islands. No one knows what it may show or even if it worked. Cool, all right, so um, I've been kind of scouring the drop cam footage every day trying to look for some uh, cool stuff. Strange creatures appear. And this is a, the first drop that I did at Henderson. And how close were you to the animal? This one's uh, 200 something <laughs> meters. <laughs> so I like that he just falls right in there. I found, uh, I think, gray reef sharks. They went down to about maybe 300 meters, and then anything below 600 meters, you can see these guys. Yeah. The depths hold rarely seen sharks. They're bigger and slower than the reef sharks. It's shark -o vision Yeah. <laughs> but like their combative cousins, they rule a world that's as mysterious as it is untouched. You know, nobody has been studying these deep sea environments before. And what we saw blew our minds. Whoa! Whoa! Check that out. These new revelations win Alan the team's respect. The beginning of the trip, it was pretty hard. Helicopter got lost in the ocean. It's really nice that I was able to get through all that and actually still capture some stuff that actually looks like it's going to be useful for science. It seems like there are some cool species that they're interested in learning more about, and thankfully, like there's that one weird shark with the long, narrow dorsal fin, and he kind of just wandered perfectly through the frame. So, luck shot, I guess, but that's still really cool. In all, the scientists discovered eight entirely new species of fish. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Ducey, Henderson's marine world is untainted. Back on the island, Mike Fay can't say the same. I would have loved to have been able to not seen rats, but uh, you know, just the way, the way it is. He makes one final survey of the coastline and comes across something even more alarming. Thousands of kilometers at sea, Mike Fay stumbles on a shocking scene. Here on a speck in the middle of the Pacific, garbage. This is the east beach of Henderson Island here. And what is most impressive about this beach is pretty obvious. The amount of trash. It's pretty unbelievable actually. Just littered with fishing paraphernalia, fishing crates, containers for water, floats, nets, Everything you can imagine connected with the fishing industry. You think, you know, this is one of the most isolated islands in 
the entire world really certainly in the Pacific uninhabited out in the middle of nowhere hundreds and hundreds of miles from the nearest human habitation and it's just covered in trash though the islands far from human settlements it may not be far from fishing Commercial fishing could unravel all the Pitcairn Islands, leaving the islanders little hope of survival. I've been a commercial fisherman for nearly 30 years. And if commercial fishing was allowed in here, they would just spoil it, it would ruin it. It would go from what it is now to decimated within five years, I would think. There'd be nothing left. It's only a matter of time, really. You know, I think it would be a very sad day for them to see a big long line boat around their island taking the fish that they really cherish. The question is whether fishermen have already stripped fish from nearby waters. The team rushes back to Pitcairn to find out. Since the days of the bounty, Pitcairners have survived by fishing their waters. Enrique wants to know if Pitcairn's reefs have fared as well as the other islands. We know what the pristine coral reef looks like. What happens when we put a small human population in one of these places? Okay, ready? All right, everybody, see ya. Underwater, something's different. There was a halo of murky water all around the island. So we could not dive at the shallow places where they promised us to see so many fish. Should we go We were a little disappointed, so we decided to go deeper. The strange conditions drive them further offshore. But at these depths, the chances are slim they'll find many fish. Okay. From the first plunge, however, they discover something unexpected. There we found a new deep coral reef that had not been reported previously. Fantastic coral reef covered by healthy corals and lots of fish. Usually we find tropical reefs at 18 meters or less. This one is twice as deep. We have corals deeper than what we would expect. Probably because the water is so clear, you know, more than 60 meters visibility. Life is thriving in the crystal clear depths. The scientists survey the fish and are shocked by what they find. There are no sharks. Something here is wrong. We didn't see any sharks. We saw some medium-sized groupers. The place doesn't seem pristine. It seems in, in good shape, but definitely not pristine. Something here has taken the sharks. And no one is sure what it is. While Enrique hunts for answers, Mike Fay checks the island. It's a dangerous task. Pitcairn is wild and rugged. Climbing is treacherous. Incredibly steep slopes, and the soils are extremely slick. And it's freaking dangerous. <laughs> really dangerous, and it's scary. In places, it's a sheer and deadly drop. I don't want to fall off the mountain here. <laughs> that's my main, that's my main, uh, worry because if you go down here you go down <laughs> you go down all the way 
but Mike presses on. That is insane. A big old slide, whole frickin' valley came down here. An enormous landslide has destroyed this hilltop. You know, the fact that you've lost an entire hillside on a very small island, it's like you don't want huge chunks of your island falling into the sea. The discovery drives Mike further. The wild island is showing significant wear and tear. You know, mutiny came here 1790, so people have been pretty intensively using this place for over 200 years. Fishing and chopping the vegetation, cultivating and building trails and roads. It's a heck of a lot of human use here. The small human presence has changed the island, and after an unusual amount of heavy rain, maybe even the sea. You see this gigantic plume of soil in the ocean emanating from what is this gigantic slide on the south side of the island. It's probably covering up everything that's living down below and killing it slowly but surely. The impact of even a few humans can be surprisingly large. What we see in a lot of you know places, particularly small places, is even a modest amount of human impact can, you know, have a pretty significant impact on the resources below. Though the islanders fish on a small scale, other factors may be altering the reef. People on this island, they're not only just fishing on this island, and there's a huge amount of sediment in this water. That connection between the land and the sea becomes very apparent. But 50 years ago, it was different. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your hospitality. We are all so happy to be back on the island. We have a little surprise. Some of you may remember Louis Marden. Long before Enrique arrived, another National Geographic expedition came to Pitcairn. So when Louis Marden came in 1956, he filmed with a 16 millimeter movie camera. 60 years later, we have the film in this machine. The movie silence, you can talk as much as you want. <laughs> this is new, this is a new technique, okay? 50 years ago, the reef looked better. There was no murky shroud covering the coral. Surprisingly, that was when there were nearly three times as many people as today. It was so exciting to see that footage. I was 14 when Lewis Martin was here. To see, you know, all the people because the population was so much bigger. Now, the entire population can fit in this room. And the community is still shrinking as young adults leave to find a future off the island. Their future is at risk, and they need a solution fast. All the islanders have is this bit of land and the boundless sea. Now, even that seems threatened. The muddy runoff is obscuring the shallow reefs blocking out the light that sustains the corals. But could the islanders' impact really eliminate the sharks? Or is it something else? Enrique worries that commercial fishing could be closing in. And that's not good news for the Pitcairners. The ocean is their biggest resource. If the ocean is depleted, there goes their livelihood. And this is what's on the line. Right now, we are headed to Oino our last destination in the Pitcairn Archipelago. Oino will be a good indicator of how fast we need to act 
to keep these places pristine. Owino is about 120 kilometers northwest of Pitcairn. Of the four islands, it's closest to French Polynesia, the nearest inhabited islands and fishing fleets. Getting to Owino proves the most challenging. We hit the worst weather we could have. Rain, rain and more rain, strong winds, and the swell was breaking so hard on the reef that anchoring was very dangerous. And that made it really difficult for us. Below, conditions are no less troubling. Owino's reef lacks the vitality of Henderson and Ducey. Though the fish appear healthy, Enrique realizes it's the same problem as at Pitcairn. There are no sharks. Here, where there are no people. Why are there no sharks in this remote, uninhabited atoll in the middle of the Pacific? And the only answer that comes to mind is fishing. Any remote place has predators. Owino is closest to the outside world. Enrique fears that foreign fishing vessels have stripped the reef of its sharks. If there is fishing at Owino, what's next? Are these foreign fleets going to start hitting Henderson and then Ducey, which is a totally pristine place? To the team and many islanders, the solution is clear. Create a marine reserve, protecting the entire Pitcairn archipelago. A marine reserve is an area that we set aside without fishing to allow marine life to recover. It may help the Pitcairners as well. Tourism. Not rare stops for island trinkets and bounty lore, but ecotourism built on a protected marine reserve. We're talking about global recognition for a unique marine environment, a completely new set of economic alternatives, including ecotourism. That would bring new life to the island. And if the Pitcairners agree, it would be the largest in the world. Enrique and Heather Bradner of the Pew Environment Group discuss the idea with the islanders. To the members Edward in exploring this concept of a large marine reserve here together. I'm certainly in favor of the uh, reserve because I think that, you know, what, what have we really got to lose is not being... Maybe having a marine reserve and building a tourism industry is one way that we can create a future. I think this marine protected area, it makes perfect sense to them when they think about it. They're extremely proud of where they live. Okay, we got a new waypoint. Here we go. The closer people are connected to the land, the more conservation makes sense to them. The plans are in motion. Already a new team is mobilizing to investigate Mike Fay's rat sighting on Henderson. It's the first of many steps toward protecting all the Pitcairn Islands and preserving their timeless waters. A marine reserve could completely change the image that people have about the Pitcairn archipelago. We could go beyond the bounty and understand that the Pitcairn Islands harbor some of the last healthy environments left in the ocean. And they are so valuable that not knowing about that would be a tragedy. I really do think Pitcairn has a chance. I'm sure there's got to be other mad people like me that will want to come back for this lifestyle um, and create a future.